Hey, everybody, welcome in. It is another edition of the Utopia Football Podcast, a Thursday edition of the show. Great to be with you. I'm Sean Pendergast, the one half of Payne and Pendergast on Sports Radio 610, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. weekdays. And you can catch us uh, on the Odyssey app. You can catch us, obviously, over the air on Sports Radio 610 uh, on AM radio. But the Odyssey app is a great way to do it. Our podcast is on there as well, which has been popping. And then you can uh, watch us as well now on YouTube and Twitch. So a lot of different ways to consume the show. I personally, doesn't matter to me which one you use, as long as you're listening to the show. Similar to this podcast, if you're watching it streaming on video or if you're uh, listening to it wherever it is you get your podcast, I appreciate that. If you found the podcast and you haven't yet subscribed, please do so. Subscribe, give us a rating, give us a review. That always helps the cause as well. But the subscribe is the big thing because if you enjoy the podcast and especially getting ready for the upcoming season, which I can't wait to to do in part here with our guest, Cody Stutes is going to join me in just a second from Houston football. Um, we, uh, uh, But we appreciate the subscribe. That makes it easy. Then it shows up on whatever device it is you want to listen to the podcast. And again, a quick reminder, if you want to send an email, um, this coming Tuesday will, might be the last mailbag, second to last, maybe before training camp, before I shut it down for a week, week and a half for vacation. So get them in. H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com. H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com. And without further ado, we bring him onto the stage. Houston football's very own Cody Stutes. And you can see his handle right there at Cody underscore Stutes on uh, the platform normally known or, or formerly known as uh, as Twitter. Cody, good to see you, man. How you doing? I call it Twitter. I call it X. I call it all sorts of things. I go back and forth on it, you know. Yeah. It's don't want to piss off the algorithm too much, but I call it both things these days. Right? Yeah, I should just send everything twice. Like, here's X and here's Twitter. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> engagement, double the engagement, baby. Exactly. Yeah. How you doing, man? Uh, we got all the we got all the uh, the mini camps and the OTAs out of the way, and we're we're in probably the shortest dead period that we've had in the history of the Texans because we've got a Hall of Fame game coming up. What's fun, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, Sean. This is the last, like, June dead period if they change the way the offseason is set up. Because if you remember, and, and you've been doing this for a while now, like, the draft happens at the end of April, but it kind of carries you through May, and there's some more player movements and things like that. And then you kind of have, like, those little workouts and mini camps, and then there's that big break. Well, the Texans have the shorter break because they play in the Hall of Fame game, and they get going you know, two weeks before everybody else. And then if they change the schedule next year where all of it starts to really begin and ramp at the end of June and just goes all the way through the Super Bowl, then we, we may be in the last June swoon ever. Yeah. What are you rooting for there? Because, I mean, there's – um. I think there's football reasons to root for either one, the way they do it now versus, you know, kind of doing away with all the OTAs and mini camps and just starting in June. And there's certainly – personal preference in terms of how it affects our calendars as media members and stuff like that. Like what, what do you, do you have a preference on either one? I kind of hope it stays the same just to be, just to be honest with you, because it, I think long-term it's a negative for the Texans because they practice in a hundred degree heat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I saw the news the other night. I don't know why I was watching the news, but it's like, Oh, heat wave in the Northeast. It's 90 degrees. I was like, oh, dude. Dude. I, was like I, I pray for 90. I did. I did an interview in Green Bay a couple days ago with uh, the afternoon show up on a on a Green Bay affiliate up there. To, they're previewing the Packers season and they're talking to somebody from each of the opponents or whatever. And I get on there. He's like, I, I'm like, how you doing, Marcus? He's like, man, I'm good. It's just, it's we're just dealing with the heat up here. I'm like, okay, <laughs> give me the temperature. 81. <laughs> 81. 81. 81. Oh my God. And I said, Marcus, this is my time to make fun of you because I know you will make fun of us when we're complaining about it being 42 degrees in December. So <laughs> that's true. That's true. There's a flip side. But so you would you would like it to stay the same then, huh? Yes. I I and I, I I still think most of the players would prefer it that way. Um, I feel like there's a vocal minority that wants it to change. But I the way it works for me, I think it like because if you switch it, I think the football people never take a break. Yeah. Like, I, I think if you switch it, the football people will never take a break. Like, they'll take yeah. a, maybe a small break there in May. But um, the the players will get their time off no matter what, no matter yeah. the setup. Uh, if you switch it, the football people will basically never go on vacation. Yeah, and kind of what you're referring to there, I know, is something that I've heard uh, – not anybody by name, but more so reports from people who've talked to front office people who say, look – 
the one time we can actually get together with our families on the calendar right now is from the middle of June through training camp. That's the only time because yeah. the kids are all out of school. It's summer vacation time. It's very convenient to do some, you know, family things. Then it's a nice consecutive, really, it's a good, nice chunk of five weeks where guys are still working. Are you, Nick Casario is probably at NRG stadium today. I'm guessing, you know what yeah. I mean? Unless, yeah. unless he's on his actual vacation with his family right now, but when they're not on their actual vacation up at the Cape or whatever, you know, they are working and doing things and getting ready for the season. But I, I like, I kind of feel that way too, not only for them, but just for, for, for me, for guys in our business, the dead time has always been the first two weeks of July. I mean, there's always something going on, but now that NBA free agency is kind of really a popcorn fart way more than it used to be. Yep. Um, there's really nothing much other than just regular season baseball going on in that first couple of weeks of, of July. So I, I just think it fits in nice and seamlessly there. Um, and I think for fans too, you know, like for fans like that, they're, they're kind of getting ramped up for the football season and they're away in July and things like that. I don't know. I, I, it feels like one of those things. Like, I don't know why they're messing. Why are they fucking around with this? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like why is it like, it's, it's fine. Cause people like Aaron Rodgers who yeah. have complained about showing up and doing off season workouts for 10 years, continue oh. to complain about it. And yeah. And yeah. You, you know, guys like him try to abuse the NFL PA for their own gain. Yeah. Now we should mention too, before we get, we're going to, you and I are going to do seven questions in honor of the great Coleridge Stroud, the fourth uh, Jersey number seven. We're going to do seven questions surrounding the Texans coming out of mini camp, going into training camp, going into the season. And we'll dig into those in just a second. But you and I were talking before we started recording. Um, you, you are one of a few people, and by the way, H O U football.com is where you can find Cody. We should mention that H O U football dot com is is his website subscribe to his 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 emails and things like that there cody does a great job of just giving you what you need with the texans with the perfect blend of conciseness humor and most importantly intelligent analysis so i can't recommend uh hou football.com enough but you're going to be one of just i'm guessing just a handful of people that are going to actually be at these practices that they're going to have in ohio in between the hall of fame game and the game what would normally be the first preseason game, but for the right. Texans, it's the second one in Pittsburgh. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's what, and there's, that's what I pride myself on. I'll be at every training camp practice and I give you, I give you observations on every training camp practice. And when I say every one, when it's in the middle of nowhere, Ohio, I'm there. Like, yeah, man. I, I'm going to be there. Um, and those, those, those will be really interesting practices because they're going to have had a good ramp up, you know, ahead of game one of the preseason, then they're going to have sort of a, a kind of a few days of rest. They're going to play that game. They'll have the day off after the game. Then they'll have Andre Johnson day at the hall of fame. And then it's kind of just like a, you know, a little bit of a blip in training camp that you don't really usually have. Yeah. Then they're going to hit those three days in Ohio coming off of that little break. And I got to imagine those are going to be pretty tough practices. Yes. And then they'll have the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, for preseason game number two. And so I, I, I'm really excited about those three practices because if the weather is different than it is in Houston, which I expect it to be, they may have the ability to kind of put the foot on the pedal just a tiny bit more than if those practices were the first couple of days of August yeah. in, in in Houston, Texas. There there will be at least one of those three where there's a lot of hitting going on, if I, I had to so. guess. I'm very, right. I'm very excited about that. I don't know anything about Cleveland, Ohio. Or the greater Ohio area. You never been? I, I've never been. Okay. Okay. I've so people been. are going to tell you. I've been several times. I used to date a girl from South Euclid, Ohio, when I was in college. <laughs> she looked like Susanna Hoffs. I dated her for easily three months longer than I should have. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I so I've spent a fair amount of time in Cleveland. Not recently. Um, I think the Guardians are at home. While I don't know if they're home that week after the Hall of Fame. They're home the weekend of the Hall of Fame. As is SummerSlam, Cody. SummerSlam is in Ohio the Sunday of that weekend there. You know, I don't know where HOUfootball.com is on covering WWE, but I know where Cody Stutes is on uh, wanting to be at WWE events. May try to sneak that in. Sure. Atta boy. Atta boy. Certainly. Yeah, I got to figure out. I mean, my big thing is I'm worried about getting the practices, watching yeah. them, and then I'm worried about what I'm going to eat because I don't know what Ohio does for food. Yeah, I, that's the thing. I wish I could tell you, like, food wise, because it, it's Ohio. Everybody's gonna say, go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, go to a go to a Guardians game if you can there that time of year. 
Um, but I, yeah, I don't know what they're famous for. You may end up eating at a lot of chains and things like that while you're, uh, <laughs> while you're up there. Uh, you know, Hey, I went, I went to this great place in Cleveland, uh, Applebee's. It was really, really, <laughs> it's really good. Eating good really in the good. neighborhood. Sean. Eating good in the neighborhood. That's it, man. Okay. So that's cool. So you're going to be there and you know that, um, that's Nick Casario's high school that he went to. Did you know that? I did not know that. I know, yeah. that, I know that it's not that far off from what is it? John Carroll. John Carroll, yeah. From there. Yep. Yeah, yeah it's uni University High School and Nick Casario went there. I was alerted to that the day they the day that the day after they announced the training camp schedule and we were going through it on Payne and Pendergast and Vandermeer texted me he's like, "You know, this is uh Nick Casario's high school." So I immediately texted Nick and said, "Is there going to be a Nick Casario reality tour for the team?" <laughs> There's got to like, "Hey, this is where I did this." <laughs> he said no. <laughs> he said no. Just lots of pictures of bad haircuts. That's it. <laughs> so, um so that'll be fun for Nick for sure to get back up near family, I would imagine. All right, so good. So the upshot of all this, before we get into the seven questions, is uh, go to houfootball.com, subscribe to all of Cody's stuff, and make sure you know that he is one of the the few, the proud, that are going to be having eyes on what could be some very interesting practices post-Hall of Fame game, pre-Pittsburgh game, that week in between those two games. Uh, I guess that would be August the 5th, 6th, and 7th, right? Is, I think right. is Yeah, August 5th, 6th, and 7th, I think, are those dates, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, so sad that I know that off the top. The only reason I know that is because of this the freaking Texans training camp schedule tattooed on my brain right now. I just can't wait. I are you excited that it's happening a week earlier? Does this feel like Christmas coming early for you? Oh, absolutely. Yes, I'm the same. I'm the I, same. I mean, it's it, it, to to have it be one of the most exciting seasons coming up, and then and just have early. it get here earlier. Yeah, it's like ah, uh, you know, is it going to be tough for them? Right, you know, starting early when they got to finish in New Orleans. You know, I don't know. Yeah, this is the year. I know my dad got a bonus at work, so we're definitely getting a pinball machine. <laughs> what is that? Oh, Christmas is on the seventeenth now. Hell yeah, eight more days of pinball. This yeah. is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. Same exact thing. Uh, all right, cool. Well, let's get to seven questions then. Cody Stutes, HOUfootball.com. And I'm going to start, Cody, with most interesting roster battle storyline. And this can be this can be a battle for a starting position. This can be a battle at the back end of the 53. I don't know. Have you cobbled together a, a, an early 53-man roster yet from any of these mini camps? I, ha I have not done back that. Back of really. the napkin or anything? Yeah. I mean, I got a sneaky suspicion on how some of it's shaken out, but uh, no, I haven't done the 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 official way too early fifty three man prediction. Okay. Um, so with so, that in mind, which, which what's your favorite storyline roster storyline here? I wanted to tell you that it's left guard, but I can't sell you that offensive line play is as interesting as some of these other battles. Yeah. Like there's there's a lot of guys at left guard. I I believe Juice Scruggs is going to be the center. So I believe the left guard battle is primarily Kenyon Green, Kendrick Green, and Jarrett Patterson fighting for that spot. But that's not as interesting because there's only going to be a, a finite amount of opportunities to really analyze that. Mm -hmm. What you can really dig in, in in training camp and pay attention to is a cornerback battle. Mm -hmm. And cornerback two for this team is a supremely interesting situation because you've got three very unique stories if that player ends up as cornerback two opposite Derek Stingley. Obviously, it's Kamari Lassiter. Hey, great job, great pick. Uh, Texans, you know, got the sixth cornerback, but he ended up actually being one of the best rookie cornerbacks. Like, awesome. Like, mm -hmm. that's a great setup. Yep. If it's Jeff Okuda or CJ Henderson, they both basically have the same story, but it's a story of redemption from failing at the NFL level. Okuda yeah. was a former third overall pick on his third team now. CJ Henderson's 10th overall pick on his third team now. And if either of those guys locks down cornerback too, like that's a really fun, interesting thing to follow because there's still something there. It feels like from the Texans point of view on these young, uh, sticky and long players is kind of the, the phrasing that D'Amico Ryans has used on them. They like the fact that these guys are young. They like the fact that they can stick with guys from an athleticism standpoint. And they like the fact that they have, you know, longer limbs than your typical corner. And, you know, like I think the 49ers are a great example for a long time. They kind of made hay on reclamation projects off the beaten path, trusting young guys in the secondary. And this kind of feels like where 
uh, the Texans are in that cornerback two spot. Yeah, I, I think a couple, you said a couple of interesting things there. Okay, so as far as I'll start with the cornerback first, since that's what we're just coming off of here. I hope whoever wins it, I, I have no rooting interest, but I guess I do. I'm, I'm kind of rooting for Kamari Lasseter because he's the one that we know is going to be here for the next four years. So if he locks that down, that means you've got Kamari Lasseter and presumably Stingley for the next several years once they mm-hmm. give him a big contract extension. So you've got that position locked down with two with 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 two really good cornerbacks. So I guess I'm rooting for Lasseter just purely from the the longevity standpoint. My hope for 2024 is that whoever wins it wins it. You know what I mean? That it's not well, like a it's not the lesser of three lessest of three evils that it's whoever gets it. Like you use the word locks down the cornerback position. Like I, whoever gets it, I hope like we look at it and we go, man, that guy, that guy earned that spot. Now it'd be great if he, who had, he won the spot and he won it, but it was a real battle and you feel like you've got really good depth. That, that would be the exciting thing. That'd be the exciting thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like I hope it's not like when Kareem Jackson was drafted, he was handed that spot and he clearly wasn't ready for it back in the day. You know, I hope it's not something like that. As far as the left guard thing, um, and selling selling me on offensive line being being interesting. I think the one thing that makes it interesting with Kenyon Green is is that it feels like there's still a sliver of hope that they salvaged the 15th overall pick from the draft a couple of years ago. You know, there's there's still that emotional attachment to Kenyon Green, especially because that pick is tied to the Deshaun Watson trade. At least it is for me. I don't know if I reflect the feelings of fans out there from that standpoint. I feel like every time I bring up Deshaun Watson on Payne and Pendergast, people are like, are you going to move on from this at some point? Like, And we have moved on. Like, The only time we talk about Deshaun now is when there's a relevant news item about Deshaun. But people still get so triggered when they hear his name that I, I do wonder if there's people out there that that um, are, are hoping that Kenyon Green wins that spot. I mean, honestly, probably the best thing for the Texans to win that spot would be somebody like Jared Patterson. Then you don't get in that – it caught in that shuffle of, okay, now do we have to give a fifth year option to Kenyon green? Is right. this another guy we got to worry about signing to a long-term contract? Cause they're going to have a lot of money. They're going to be spending on guys. I just hope whoever wins it similar to cornerback clearly wins it. And they're clearly ready for the spot. I'm, I'm less rooting for an outcome in that a specific outcome than I am. Just give me a good player at that spot right there. Yeah. I'm rooting, I'm rooting for the best guy, not the best story. Yeah. I left guard. Like, get, get, get me. I don't care if it's Kendrick green who, yeah. you know, added, you know, late in the, training camp last year and you know played okay for a handful of weeks till you know that he got hurt against the Steelers you know mm-hmm. I don't I don't care if it's him I just make sure that left guard is a solid left guard um and I don't care if it's former first round pick or former late round pick Jared Patterson or yeah between. those are good ones I, I'll toss a log on the fire here as we're doing these seven questions and I'm I am anxious to see how the wide receiver position plays out after the first I'll call it three and a half guys because it sounds like Mechie has done enough to really impress people this offseason where I don't think he's going anywhere. Um, okay. So, I, so I, I, I'll so I, call it four. But then, I mean, Robert Woods is still on this team. They traded for Ben Skoranek. Um, you've, you've still got Xavier Hutchinson there. I feel like I'm – well, no, that because that, they're seven. Um, I guess Steven Sims is still in camp. You know, do, do you keep a return guy on the roster when you're going to have – it looks like at least – six maybe at least five if not six receivers on this team does sims have to be one of those guys because he's your best return guy now so i think that one's really interesting too noah brown you didn't mention noah brown my god yeah 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 noah brown so so there's gonna be and nick casario has said this there's gonna be a good receiver that gets cut by this team you know there's gonna be a receiver that gets gets cut by this team that gets picked up immediately by some other nfl team out there probably I mean, if, if John Mechie is – is we're going to get the best version of John Mechie and he's close to what you hoped he was going to be as a second-round pick. He's in. And then, and then Noah Brown is a a similar player to what he was last year. Yeah. That's a really good 4-5. Like, Absolutely. You look around the league at some of the guys who are 4-5 or five and the, the potential and track records of 4-5 and five wide receivers on most depth charts is, is not there. Like, no. it is not there compared to what – Mechie could be and what Noah Brown could be. Brown didn't didn't do anything in the the you know the offseason workouts because he's coming back from a offseason surgery. But yeah. I would expect that he's absolutely going to be a factor and could could be pushing Mechie for that four spot, could easily be the four or five, however you want to phrase it. Um, and then yeah, that six spot, hey, Woods, he's got special teams usefulness, Sims, Skaronic, Hutchinson, like. Lots of guys. Lots, lots of, of guys. guys. Lots of lots of different skill sets too. So those are those will be some interesting interesting battles as we try to get this thing down to fifty three, come September. All right, second one, Cody. We're doing seven questions. 
non-CJ Stroud MVP of the Texans in 2024? I'm going to go with Daniil Hunter. And the reason I'm going with Daniil Hunter is I was surprised that defensive coordinator Matt Burke did this, but he kind of in a comment about Daniil Hunter and talking about him, he just kind of slid in that they believe there's a little bit more to Daniil Hunter in this defensive system. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's, <laughs> that's 16 and a half sacks last year. 16 and a half sacks was fifth in the league, tied yeah. for the league lead in tackles for a loss. I mean, pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty good if he gets yeah. a little bit better, even if he gets a little bit better. Yeah. Um, Hunter's in here to combat Jonathan Grenard's production from last year and improve on it. Yeah. Um, and, and Grenard was like, I, I don't, I don't want to go revisionist history. Jonathan Grenard was very good last year. Mm -hmm. Like he was productive in the passing game. He was productive in the running game. Like he had solid stats across the board. Yeah. I just don't know that you believe that Jonathan Grenard showing up every year of the NFL season. That's right. Daniel Hunter is, is Mr. Consistency. And so uh, I, I, and, and I look around at the team that he's on. I mean, this is going to be one of the better teams that he has played on. Oh, yeah. And so not only is the system maybe better for him, the team is better than he's played on any of his previous teams. Like, it gets really exciting on defense with him. You stole mine. I was going to do Daniil Hunter as well, so I'll do a different one. Um, uh, I'm going to go – this may be a little off the grid because the tendency is to go, well, look at all the star power on offense. You got Nico Collins because we're doing non-CJ MVP. Nico, Tank. Uh, Stefan Diggs, uh, you know, those are three guys that could put up, he could put up 1, 1,400 yards this year, maybe multiple. Um, a lot of talent on that side. And you got Will Anderson, who's ready to break out, a defensive rookie of the year last year. I'm going to go a guy who has been talked about a ton by guys on both sides of the ball, who's really now finally, finally got his chance last year. Now he's getting his chance on a team that's going to be. I think I think defense is going to be really good, and now he's reunited with D'Amico Ryan's, and that's Aziz Alshire, non-Texans MVP. I think he's got a chance to be a Pro Bowler on this defense. Um, he's already established himself as a true leader on that defense, and that's just with no pads on out at these practices, and I would imagine in the building as well. Um, Casario told a story with me and Seth. We brought up Aziz Alshire, and he 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 couldn't stop talking about it. And he talked about how Nick went to go work out one day. And at, at they're working out over in the bubble because they're redoing the weight room right now. So all the weights and the machines are all in the bubble. And Aziz Alshire is by himself in the bubble with no other players there, wa just walking with a weighted vest on <laughs> in the middle of the summer. Um, and, and like even CJ says, he talks to Aziz after practice. And, and CJ does that talking to defensive guys so he can kind of get the answers to the test a little bit. But Aziz has been one of those guys. Aziz is going to be the green dot guy on this defense. Like, he is already establishing himself as both the schematic leader and I think the emotional leader. And the guy hasn't even played a regular season snap yet. He's super productive when he does get a chance to play, as we saw last year and as we saw in spurts with San Francisco. And now him with D'Amico as his head coach with this responsibility that's being handed him, that's my pick. Aziz, if not Daniel Hunter, Aziz Alshire. And – Excellent linebacker play is a hallmark of good defense in the National Football League now. Yes. Like the Baltimore Ravens last year, tops in the league in points allowed per game. They had two Pro Bowl linebackers, Patrick Crean and Roquan Smith. Kansas City Chiefs have good linebacker play. Obviously, we know what San Francisco brings to the table. Same with Buffalo. Like those are your top four defenses in points allowed last year. And yeah. if you want to go with yards, the Browns had good linebacker play as well. Like linebacker play, good linebacker play, versatility. Knowing where everybody's supposed to be, it is a hallmark of good defense in the NFL now, and Aziz Alshire should bring that. Yeah, yeah. You're going to have him and Christian Harris together for at least two seasons in that linebacking core. That's really – with D'Amico Ryans as their head coach. That's super exciting. All right, question number three. Are the Texans done with any moves this offseason – that move the needle. We know there's going to be little pickups on the, on the margins and whatnot, but, you know, there's those lists out there, Cody, of, hey, the 10 guys that are still out there on the street, you know, that street-free agent guys, and none of them are going to get big money, I don't think, but, you know, the names, Justin Simmons and Xavier Howard, guys like that. Do you think there's another move in the Texans between now and training camp with guys of that ilk? No, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I, 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 it feels to me like they're done. Um, if the If the Ryan Tannehills as backup quarterback or the – Xavier Howards as a cornerback guy that was going to, you know, compete for this team. Like 
I, if all that was going to happen, it would have happened already. They would have yeah. needed to get those guys in the building, in the system, starting to get them familiar with things. Now, something happens in training camp, they want to make mm -hmm. a move, sure. But uh, your question is, before you know, we get going here, no, nothing significant is coming. Yeah, yeah, they'd have to get hurt in the weight room, whoever it is, you know, right? Like it, yeah, <laughs> something like that, because there's no real opportunities. And to like, how how injured. good are some of these players? Like, I mean. Look, don't get me wrong. I, I I believe in Xavier Howard probably more than I believe in Okuda or Henderson, but I understand the conversation around Okuda or Henderson uh, if you bring them in. Jamal Adams isn't any good anymore. Um, no. You know, no. Hunter Renfro, he'd just be another body that would have a hard time cracking the, the you know the top six if he was yep. on this team. Yeah. Like you, just, you go through some of the names here, and it's like, eh, maybe a little safety depth, but you know, it seems like those guys are probably holding out for a chance to start, um, you know, Simmons and Diggs. Yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. Those would be the two names at safety: Justin yeah. Simmons and, and Quandre Diggs for sure. I'm with you on that. I think they're. I think this is the. You know, as uh, Norman Dale said, my team is on the court. You know, I think that's what Nick Casario and D'Amico Ryan's. Are. They're pointing at all 90 guys and saying, "My team's on the. My team's at the Methodist Training Center right now." Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's it. All right, that was an easy one. All right, question number four: Who or what is Damian Pierce right now? I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But here's what I do know. Last year, he's one of the worst football players on the team, and he's one of the worst running backs in football. Yep. Listen to these stats here. Oh. 49th in yards per carry, 47th in rush yards over expected per attempt, 47th in yards after contact per attempt, and a 46th overall in pro football focus is rushing grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of those, I think it was four stats you just recited there. The one to me that just screams red flag and something last year was just way off with Damian Pierce. And we know there was. He admitted it. Like he's he was on the post game show with me and Clint after the game where he had the kickoff return, that Cleveland game. And he was he 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 admitted, like, yeah, I'm having trouble grasping the offense. They're not gonna get the version of me they want until next season. He was very honest about it. That yards after contact thing to me is the one where that just as uh as uh as Paulie Walnuts would say to Tony, that don't compute to me, T. Yeah. Uh, you know, like that that one, if you watch Damian Pierce's rookie year YouTube highlights, and then you tell me that guy the next year was 47th in yards after contact, like there was something, there was something about Damian Pierce not being able to grasp this offense that affected his physicality. <laughs> you know, like he was he was very easy to bring down last year, relatively. So he loved, he still leaned into being very physical because that's always who he's gonna be, but there were none of those runs. Yeah, I don't expect all of them to be the Jacksonville run where he's got seven yeah. guys bouncing off of him. They weren't in. He had way more than those. Right. Yeah. Right. He, yeah. 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 The, the, it was, it was, I wonder if, and I've heard, you know, rumors, speculation that maybe he just wasn't in great shape, not because of his own doing come training camp, but he just never caught back up. Mm -hmm. um, you combine some sort of physical issue with not being able to grasp the offense and you get the last season. Here's yeah. what I know about Damian Pierce up to this point. He's had an entire offseason to grasp the offense. He's either going to get it or he's not going to get it, okay? Mm -hmm. There's a belief in him in the organization to some point because the challengers for his job are Dare Agumbawale, Jawar Jordan, who is a sixth-round pick, and British Brooks, who is an undrafted free agent. That's right. Okay? Those are the challengers for his job. And as far as showing up for OTAs and minicamp, he looks to be in fantastic shape. I feel like he has trimmed up from a muscle standpoint, not that he's just lost the weight. It feels like he has lost body fat to maybe turn himself into that wrecking ball that he was at times in his rookie year. Yeah. So I, I know he ha has an opportunity. Okay. He's a player who, you know what Damian Pierce is right now? He's a player with an opportunity to lock down a very clear role on this team. D D'Amico Ryan said at the podium, We'd love for Joe Mixon and Damian Pierce to be the one-two punch for this team. Yep. Like, like that's a that's a ringing endorsement for your opportunity. Yep. Go out there in training camp, stink it up. All of a sudden, Jawar Jordan, British Brooks, or some uh, you know late round pick sent to another team for for a running back is is the running back for this. Team. Yeah, and that's I think touching on that right there. Like that's not out of the realm of possibility. Like I think Damian. Like we may watch that Hall of Fame game, and Damian, we may be watching that. Go, man, Damian Pierce is getting a lot of action in this game here, you know? Because I, I, to your point, I think they've got to figure out where he is against real competition. He's checked all the boxes of the things that he can possibly do so far this off season. The problem is, 
the opportunity to show off the really important stuff doesn't happen until you put pads on, you know, yeah. for that position, for that position. All and, right. and playing late into a game for Damian mm -hmm. Pierce might be good because that's still executing the offense. Yes. And like, and then, and, and the coaches can still make a value judgment on those plays. Like, Hey, Damian did his job. Oh, fourth string, right. Tackle didn't do his job. Correct. Or, or third string left guard didn't do his job, but Damian did his job. Yeah. That's going to be, can, they can grade that out. Even if he's playing late into a game. No doubt. No doubt. All right. So that's question number four, question number five, we're doing seven questions in honor of Jersey number seven for CJ Stroud. Sneakiest game on the schedule. I asked Johnny Harris this one. I had Johnny on here last week, and I asked him this one. I'm curious what yours is. Sneakiest game on the 2024 Texans schedule. I'm going to go to November. Okay. I'm going to go Sunday, November 24th at noon with the Tennessee Titans at home. That was mine. <laughs> that was mine last week when we did this. Okay, let me lay out my reasoning, and let's see if, if our reasonings are the same. Yep. You're coming off of Indy. At New York on Thursday Night Football, home against Detroit um, for Sunday Night Football, at the Dallas Cowboys on Monday Night Football. Yep. The game after Tennessee is at Jacksonville, be the second contest with the Jaguars, and after that is the bye week. Yep. It is prototype trap game. Prototype trap game. Prototype. Prototype trap game. And and I'll I'll add to that as well. You kind of pointed you you kind of pointed it out by mentioning the bye week, but just to 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 accentuate that point, they will have played 12 straight weeks of football at that. But that game will be the 12th consecutive week of football they will be playing. Tennessee, I checked, their bye week's like week five or six or something yeah. like that. You know, they so Tennessee will already have had the benefit of the bye week. You know, granted, a month before that, but still, they'll have had one. And the Texans, this we know, the Texans will not have had one. Yeah. And so... So I think I that one to me, and then all of a sudden that Jacksonville game in week 13 now is, you know, is, is I, that's not as sneaky a game because Jacksonville, that's A, it's on the road, and B, it's Jacksonville's better than Tennessee. Almost by definition, a sneaky game needs to be a team that you're a, a pretty moderately heavy favorite against. And I think they're like a six-point favorite as of right now against Tennessee at home, something like that. Yeah, I'm with you. That was the one I picked too, Cody, for a, for largely the same reasons. Now, I... I just thought coming off the three primetime games, I had forgotten that that the lead into the three primetime games is Indy at home. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's already so much smoke between Indy and the Texans with all the trash talk going back and forth with CJ and all the linebackers and everything, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, literally, I think starting at Indianapolis to the bye week, yeah. that is the stretch of this, the season that really defines who this Texans team is. Absolutely. And uh, the other thing about Tennessee, too. It's deep enough in the season that if they've got any juice, they'll have figured out how to use it. Mm -hmm. It's deep enough in the season for Tennessee at that point that they could have figured out their offensive line, which was the worst offensive line in football last year. Yeah, It's also like we could be sitting here in November, what is it, 28th, the next day, thinking about how goofy we were talking about this. It's also deep enough in the season that, that the wheels could have fallen off for the Titans. That's right. That's right. There's a lot of possibilities. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, and I don't know if that's, I, I almost wonder if them being a little bit better is better for that situation so that you have to take them a tiny bit more seriously. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That you're, yeah. I mean, that's, I look at a lot of these teams, you know, like I, the, the New England game was one Johnny Harris brought up. That was his. And it was an interesting reasoning. I, I don't know that I necessarily totally agree with Johnny and the significance of what he brought up because it's the middle of October, not the middle of December. But he did point out that'll be the first outdoor game the Texans will have played since the Baltimore playoff. I'm not counting preseason. Since the Baltimore playoff game. Um, all The first five games are all indoors. And wow. so now you're going outside in middle of October, which it's not going to be snowing, but it could be raining. It could, it could be cold. It, it's definitely not 72 and controlled like the first five games of the season will be. Right. And I, look, I, I think you've kind of heard this more and more as you, as you hear about the, it's a pain in the rear to oh, yeah. get to Foxborough. Yeah. Like it throws off your game day operation. It is not a normal, here's the hotel. Here are the buses. Stadiums downtown, boom, no. boom, boom. Like it's not that. It's a it is a pain in operating and getting to Foxborough. Any sort of weather is a big issue. Yeah, I mean it, it, that's a unique one certainly. And yeah. you have no idea what the Patriots are going to be. And like they'll still be figuring things out early on in in what they are as a team too. Which again is almost scarier because I think back to that Carolina game last year. Yep. And and New England, if you look at their schedule, when Johnny 
said that, I went and looked at New England's schedule, and their first five games are very difficult. I mean, it's New England, so all the games are going to look difficult to them because they're not very good. But I'm telling you, they play like Pittsburgh and San Francisco, and there's like one or two other – like the Jets are in there when Aaron Rodgers is still going to be healthy, um, presumably. <laughs> um, so the, so you got five – I just know this, the five games I looked at, I said one and four at best for the New England Patriots, which again, I think that'll be a test for the Texans in so much as like, okay, or do we have the losing to Desmond Ritter, losing to Bryce Young, losing to Zach Wilson Texans out of our system? Is that out of our system? Or are we going to lose to Jacoby Brissett or Drake May in week six? Right. Yeah, well, and it's the, it's the same part of the schedule that there was still like some figuring out that yeah. it, like last year for the Texans. Like, yep. um, you know, the, Hey, do we throw it this much figuring out who the running back is like hopefully things will be, be more expedited by then for the Texans. Um, yeah. You're due for a lull. It's just really good teams. When they lull, they still win ugly they still win. And, and, and that's where the Texans could find themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, I think, I think the big takeaway from that question for me was there ain't a lot of sneaky games on the schedule. I mean, they, they play heavyweights, you know, it's, yeah. it's the schedule's tough stuff. Yeah. You, you can make an argument for a lot of games having your attention to where it won't sneak up on you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which and, I'm and, cool and, with. Like both, both, I mean, the, the second Tennessee game, that's not it because that's the last game of the season. That's your last right. chance to, you know, figure out where you are in the playoff picture. Like, yeah. There's really not that many. I mean, I guess New York's going to kind of sneak up on you because it's a Thursday game. Yeah. You know, but everybody plays the Thursday game, you know, and, and, and you start to get ready for Thursday. You know, but the week before when you're still week getting before. ready for the other opponent. That's you know? it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, yeah, they, they don't play many. They don't play many clunkers on the schedule. You know, like hey, they get Minnesota early. What are they going to be with with McCarthy or Dan Darnold or whoever they have at quarterback? But that's a pretty talented football team still outside of quarterback. You know. Well, and you you got some familiar faces across the way, so so maybe you're geared up for that. Focused. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, two more. Who leads this team in receiving yards in 2024? Nico. Nico Collins. Nico? Okay. I, I, I believe in Nico Collins. Yep. Um, and, and, and a year ago, I would have told you I don't believe in Nico Collins. Um, this guy was an exceptional practice player prior to the start of last regular season. He would kick people's butts in practice. Mm -hmm. And then it just never translated on a consistent basis to game day, and he never stayed healthy. Well, turns out when you get an offense that uses him more than run him down the sideline and throw it up, and um, he stays healthy, and you have a quarterback that can actually get him the football, like where guys catch the football on his mask. Yeah, yeah not ten. I have a, my 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 great photographer Eddie Clark was at minicamp, and there's a picture from minicamp of a pass that C.J. Stroud threw to Nico Collins that I have, and Nico is like the ball is literally in Nico's face mask. It is. It's a great picture. Um. And I'm like, okay, like, so there's a little bit more to Nico. And he was really good in training camp last he year. Was. He, was, he was really good. Now, Tank Dell was the story in training camp. Yeah. Because, like, I mean, was Tank had three touchdowns against the Dolphins in the first day of joint practice. In, like, ten snaps. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it was crazy. So, like, Tank was the story in training yeah. camp last year from a wide receiver standpoint. But once the season got going, you saw Nico Collins really dominate at yeah. different levels. And then a lot of the nerds – and this is kind of from the fantasy community, but it's applicable to this Texans team. Yeah. Nico Collins was the second best wide receiver in football against man coverage last year. Yeah, yeah. Like, like and he's not getting double teamed, and you're not going to throw a bunch of zone stuff at the Texans this year. No, so, you're not. Like, he did that, and, you know, I, I think a lot of times about D'Amico Ryans, he talks about guys who aren't rookies who take that second-year jump. Like, the second year in this system, for mm -hmm. Nico Collins with CJ, there's some really exciting potential to what he brings. Oh, dude, for sure, for sure. All right, so you and I are going to need to have one of our steak dinner bets then, because I'll take Tank Dell. I'll take Tank Dell as the, the leader in receiving yards this year. I mean, people keep in mind, and I know you know this, Cody. When Tank broke his leg, he was right there with Nico statistically. You know, <laughs> like he was an ascending. Like he had had the he had the whole Antonio Brown thing going. Where he had five catches for fifty yards and a touchdown. However, you remember Antonio Brown had that streak of five catches and at least fifty yards for one hundred and sixty-eight <laughs> consecutive games. That bugged the <laughs> shit out of me so much. I hated that arbitrary stat, and yet now I'm using it against you in this argument about who's going to lead in receiving yards. I use it to more display consistency. 
than I do to use it as some sort of thing that should put the guy in Canton. Um, so I, but Tank was showing a level of consistency. I think just as important a level of connection with CJ Stroud. There were some of those plays that it was Tank and CJ doing playground ball at times. Um, and so I man, there's gonna be so much open green for this offense <laughs> this year. Like, and Tank just is a guy who I feel like I there's no bad choice with Diggs, Collins, or, or, or Dell. So n- neither neither you nor I are pointing at each other saying, that's a stupid pick. It, uh, Nico is actually probably the smarter of the two picks just based on maybe durability and the fact that we've seen him do this over a full season tank. We've not yet. I just think about like the type of player that takes advantage of situations like the Texans are about to be in with all these weapons out there. And God, I just feel like there's going to be some games where tank is just tearing the ass out of other teams. He, oh yeah, he is so good at getting open and just his moves don't look when he, when he's open and he's got to beat a guy like his moves don't look human. You know, like he, he looks like he's, his stuff looks computer generated, like his, his, his wiggle, you know what I mean? His Twitch. So, um, so I'm taking tank Dell and you and I'll do our uh, old steak night bet on that one. If you're up for it. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm totally down on that. And, and here's, here's something that really helps your tank Dell argument. Yeah. I believe. Okay. So in games where they were both healthy. Yeah. Okay. Games where they're both healthy. I believe tank was used slightly more. Um, so, you know, Nico had obviously, like obviously Nico had an amazing finish to the season, which, you know, added to the stats. There were some games where tank missed. There were halves of football where tank missed. Yeah. Um, you know, Nico didn't miss that much. By the time he, you know, missed a game or left early, you know, Tank was done for the season. That's right. Um, so um, when they both played, the, the usage was very similar. Now you yeah. throw Stephon Diggs in there. Um, now you throw one of the most productive scrimmage backs, um, you know, in football over the past four seasons and Joe Mixon in there. And yeah. it's like, okay, who who's getting like Tank on a cornerback two or Tank on a safety and a linebacker? Like, right. I mean, come on. That's yeah, it. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm with you. Like, it's, I, I say Nico because I believe he's going to be able to replicate. Uh, Tank getting more than what he did last year is, is a pretty scary proposition for opposing defense. Here's, here's the crazy thing, and this is where you got to hope that all three guys, and I'm throwing digs in there, buy into this, is that whoever's not leading the team in receiving, it's not because they're probably not doing their job or playing well. Like they're probably open also, you know, they're either just not as open or they're not the first read or whatever the case may be. You know, I talked about this with, um, when I was, I wrote about Stefan Diggs, and, and I've talked about it with him. Efficiency is going to have to replace volume for these wide receivers. Yeah. So like if I'm catching, you know, you know, Diggs had 161 targets on average in Buffalo. Yes. Yeah. And Nico, Nico Collins had 109 targets last year. Like, like, but Nico was super efficient. Um, if Diggs' targets drop off, if Tank's targets are, you know, similar, but they're big plays, yeah. they're, you know, 17 yard plays, they're touchdowns. Like, I don't know that they're going to care about volume if efficiency right. is there. Yeah. Like, you can sell efficiency, scoring, making big plays getting first downs, you can sell efficiency as sa- more satiating than volume to these guys. Yep. Yep. There was, it was interesting. I, you probably saw the same thing uh, that I, that I did on when Brady was on Cowherd and he was talking about uh, marquee receivers, diva receivers, number one receivers, and the need to get them involved early in games and get them touches. I think that'll be, and you know what? It's actually a good segue into the last, last question. Uh, of the seven questions, favorite storyline this season. I'll go. I'll just go first on this one, just because we're talking about it. But how they manage all of the mouths to feed on offense is going to be fascinating. And to circle back to that Brady cut with Cowherd, you know, Brady Brady made it sound he was very cognizant of that. Cognizant of that, you know, b- both throughout the week and certainly on game day of getting guys their touches, getting guys involved early. He was citing San Francisco as a team that's really good at doing that. They make sure Debo Samuel and Christian McCaffrey are getting touches early in games, that sort of thing. Stephon Diggs was targeted the most of any receiver in the first quarter of games, I want to say, through the first 10 games of last year. I think through the first 10 games of last year, something like that. Yeah. I, it, 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 because he stopped getting targeted a whole lot after the first 10 weeks because that's when Joe Brady took over in Buffalo. I want to say he had 40 targets in the first quarter of games through the first 10 weeks of the season last year. That's pretty gnarly. Four I mean, per game yeah. in the first quarter. 
you know? I mean, that, so. and, and like, and they're going to run the football better this year, too. So, like, yeah. getting the ball to these wide receivers, to Dalton Schultz, yeah. to, you know, Joe Mixon out of the backfield, like, you're going to have to, like, you're going to have to A, B on offense. So the defense has yeah. to take care of their, op- their, their, their opportunities. Yeah. And then you're going to have to, you know, find the productive guy. And it's like, I mean, I don't know about you. Sometimes I turn on, you know, the streaming service. I don't know what to watch. Yeah. It's, it's, it's option overload. Yes. Like that's, 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 that was part that's of the strong. beauty of, of cable TV back in the day is you flip through the channels. What's on was what's on, you yeah. know, I've watched more modern family on accident than I have on purpose. <laughs> okay. Because it's yeah. just on, you yeah. know? So that's that, like Stroud's going to have option overload. I think it's easier for him to make a decision though, because if he doesn't, a yeah. 350 pound man crashes into him. Yeah. So nobody's tackling me because I can't figure out what to watch. Dude. No, that, <laughs> they TV, should, that TV analogy is so perfect, dude. Did you say with cable or pre cable? Um, it's 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 with cable like with like, cable you know, see so that shows our age difference because you're comparing all the streaming services to a word where all you have is cable yeah i grew up in a household till i was 15 where all we had was like five channels okay yeah. Yeah. i grew up in the texans pep hamilton offense all right like okay fuck it <laughs> we'll watch chris conley again <laughs> <laughs> pep hamilton okay oh, what are you watching, Sean? Philip Dorsett again, Dad. Thanks. Can we get a satellite dish, please? Yeah. <laughs> that was the Texans offense back like two, three years ago. They were, they were, they were uh regular antenna, uh rabbit ear coat hanger antenna television. Oil on the end of yeah, the- yeah. <laughs> like the, the average offense, like te- maybe the Texans like last year with CJ. You know, rookie kind of feeling his way. You don't have quite as many weapons as you do now. That's like cable but like cable but you have all the packages you know what i mean yeah, like you, yeah. you, it's the mac daddy cable package the texans you're right cody they they have apple tv now they've got apps all over the place <laughs> they've got they, every app has an archive a mile long you can watch any yep. show from any year you want to god that is a great analogy dude yep. That, yep. Uh, that is, i don't even want i don't even want to get your answer to favorite storyline because i don't think you can do any better than that right now <laughs> that was that was tremendous but i'm going to ask you anyways favorite storyline of the season this year um, it's, it's, it's hard to pick cause there's a lot of really good ones. I, I'm going to kind of package it in as the year two crew. And here's what I would say. That's second year of CJ Stroud. That's the second year of Willie Anderson. D'Amico Ryans has talked at length multiple times, rookie season to the second year, yeah. take a big jump yeah. weeks ago. Bobby Slowick said the second year defines a quarterback's career. Mm-hmm. That's like what he can be. And where you can get into how special it is. Oh, by the way, it's the second year of Bobby Slowick as the offensive coordinator. That's right. Like it's the second year of Christian Harris in a defense that's actually going to know how to use him, and he seems to be healthy. Same with Nico Collins and Tank Dell. Like there's a lot of second year stuff. Um, you know, second year for Juice Scruggs uh, in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Second year of the offensive line coach coaching this style of offense. Chris Trouster, great one. Yep. the offensive line coach, did not coach this version of offense in Indianapolis when he mm-hmm. built the great ball of Indianapolis for, you know, those couple of years. Like, so it's the second year for him. Like, just there's so many important pieces of this organization that are in literally year two of their time that, like, they will kind of define how this season goes. Like, year two for the vast majority of this organization is defines how it is. Like if Will Anderson's awesome, you could survive Daniel Hunter being a little bit less than what he was last year. If Christian Harris is great, maybe Aziz Alshire doesn't have to be a pro bowler at linebacker. Yeah. Like, you know, I think there's just so many different things, coaches and players. Like I call them the year two crew. Like, cause the like Ryan's has talked so much about year two is so important. And, and really, how do you handle success? They didn't handle it well at the start last football season. Yep. How do you handle it from a successful off season? You know, that's a great one. That's year two crew. I like year it. Year, year two crew. I would throw a sub storyline in there. I'm anxious. I I've kind of liked this uh, redemption or 180 degree flip PR wise on the McNairs, Hannah and Cal. I'm, I'm anxious to see like in a year, if, if this is a team, if this is a team that, that does what people think it can do, this is a team that reaches its potential 
you know, where does Cal start to get viewed as an owner amongst other owners in this city? You know what I mean? Like it, sure. when they were, he was getting hit with sell the team two years ago, you know, yeah. I don't think I've ever, that might be the biggest redemption story out of any of the teams here in town. Like that, that Cal McNair has become a bit of a cult hero here in town merely by doing what I said he needed to do in the first place, which is just hire better people. You know, yeah. like I, yeah. I, I had said, even at the, at the, at the nadir of the McNair PR storm, when Cal was at the least popular that he was in the city, um, I, 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 dude, I would say on the radio, I'm like, I think he's a, I think he has the makings of a good owner because all you need a good owner to do is hire the right people and spend, and yeah. don't be stingy. And, and when you he would spend, he was spending when they were bad. He was paying horrible people to go away and was unfortunately replacing them with worse people at their jobs. Well, and they were constantly spending money on the organization, like. At- in addition to making people go away, like, yeah. like all, all the, all the contracts that he had to pay for people to not work for him, they're revamping the cafeteria. They're yeah. revamping uh, the new, nu- the nutrition. They did the locker rooms. Now they're doing the weight room again after they did the weight room a few years ago. Yeah. Like Nick Casario just casually offhand mentioned, like they reorganized where offices are to make things easier for the team. And it's like, yeah. he, he, and he was like, that was no small undertaking. And it's yeah. like, okay. Like, Cal McNair, to his credit, good owner, bad owner, however you do, that man has never been afraid to write a check. Nope. And and there are some there are some owners in sports that hold on to their pennies with death grips. And Cal McNair has been ready to write a check for damn near anything for the entire time he's been in charge of this. Thing. Yeah, I dude, I'm just I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready for them to win a Super Bowl. Obviously, I'm just so ready for to see Cal McNair win a Super Bowl. Like when you consider like the, the people are making fun of the Zoom calls when they're introducing people three years ago, and now three years later that there's a that there's a you know ten percent chance, eight percent chance that he could be hoisting a Lombardi Trophy this year is uh, is fascinating. To me, Han has obviously been a big part of that too. So that's like my, my sub storyline that I'm. Yeah keep an eye on there. Just the redemption of the McNairs has been really, really fun to see. Cause I think they're good people. You know, they're they're It's been, that's been really nice to see. All right, dude, H O U football.com. What do you got going on during the, uh, during the day? I still get emails from you with all kinds of awesome stuff throughout the week. So I know you're, I know you're working. Yeah. I'm, I'm really happy with my Joe Mixon article this week. There's some, there's, there's just a lot of evidence that he's going to be a juggernaut on offense. Were you surprised that CBS sports.com didn't not only didn't have him in their top 20 running backs, didn't even have him in the honorable mentions. He didn't make like the top 27. That's pathetic. Yeah. I mean, it's pathetic. And I mean, I mean, let's, let's just take what he did in, in Cincinnati and I'll give the people a little preview here. Um, He is over the past four seasons, sixth in touchdowns, eighth in running back receiving yards, and 10th in scrimmage yards amongst running backs. Last year, after Joe Burrow went down, okay, where they're mm-hmm. focusing more on the rushing attack because yeah. Lord knows you didn't have to pay attention to the quarterback. Right. Okay, he got better. In the seven games after Burrow went down, he averaged nearly 10 yards per game more, averaged a touchdown per game. He was, I think he was three yards off rushing yards per game from what Christian McCaffrey did last wow. year. Wow. In those final seven games. Wow. And that was with a Cincinnati Bengals offensive line that was ranked 26th by Pro Football Focus. Wow. Like so your article is basically you're you're saying like this could be a monster year for Joe Mixon. And 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 he has not hit the age of expiration for running. That's backs. right. Like it feels like he has because he's been around so long, but he's only 27, 28 years old right now, right? He's he's one of the most consistent running backs in football since he got in the league and started. Okay, and and, and it's it's ridiculous that people feel like he's going to have a down year. Like there, there's no signs of that unless he gets hurt. There's no signs of it. He's going to be seeing so many seven man boxes too. You know, like there, he's got he's got Dalton Schultz as his tight end, and he's got Diggs, Collins, and and Tank out there on the outside. Yeah. Um, well, cool. Okay. So that was, I read that one. That was a great piece. That was um, this week. Yep. And then yep. I got some fun, like, I think I'm going to go through some of the, um, the, the, the people have been asking for this one, Texans wide receivers versus AFC South cornerbacks. And I'm Ooh. like, okay, <laughs> let's, let me lick my chops on this one. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> like this, no kidding. This, this will be really fun. Cause there's, there's some solid cornerbacks, 
I don't think there's any great cornerbacks in this division mm, mm. Uh, that the Texans are going to go against. Yeah. And it's going to be, it's going to be kind of a fun comparison and kind of paying attention to that. Good. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's dude, it's nice to write these articles where you're ramping up to a team. That's one of the kind of hotter teams in the league, as opposed to writing articles where you're like, you know, getting ready for Davis mills to be your starter. You know? I, if it's, I was, if they were in the NFC, they might be, like number two or three in Super Bowl odds. Yeah. The yeah. fact that they're in the AFC it hurts their odds. And like, there's some teams that have no business being ahead of them in AFC. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, in Super Bowl odds, but like if they were in the NFC, they might have the second or third shortest odds to win the Super Bowl. I think it'd be them and the Niners coming out of the NFC. Like that would yeah. be the forecasted. I say that. I mean, you know, the cool thing about that is, you know, the other team that would have a say in that would be Detroit who actually went to the NFC title game. Well, guess what? They play the Texans this year. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's going to, that's my favorite game on the schedule, by the way. I, that's the one that's, you know, Sunday night coming off of 10 days, you know, between games and those two teams, like I, like the, I, how many times during that game are we going to hear a possible preview with these two forlorn franchises, you know, possible yep. preview of the Super Bowl? It's going to be, it's going to well, be really, really cool. And, and the Lions stole the Texans offseason award from last year. So Nick Casario company got to go get it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, they're GM, right? Yeah, the Lions won some, like, like best front office or something last offseason oh. for, their, for their 2023 offseason. Yeah. Um, for uh, this offseason, for last offseason, I was yeah. like, really? The yeah. Lions? I mean, Stroud and Will Anderson. What the hell, man? And Tank Dell. And Tank Dell, yeah. They had a good offseason. I don't want to make their case for them, but like they they made some like Brian Branch and Laporta and Gibbs and whatnot, blah, 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 blah. But man, they, they Nick drafted the future at quarterback. Hardware. What the hell? Yeah. Hardware, baby. Yeah, that's it, man. That's it. Uh, Cody, I appreciate it as always. People go find Cody, HOUfootball.com. Appreciate you, my friend. I will uh if I don't see you before training camp because we're going on vacation for a week and a half next week, Amy and I are. So if I don't see you before then, I'll sure I'll text with you before then, but I'll talk to you. I'll see you out of training camp, my friend. Sounds great. We'll see you then, Sean. All right, dude. I'm going to uh, cut you loose from the feed here. That's the great Cody Stutes, and you can get him at HOUfootball.com. All right, that was fun. I went As always, I went way longer than I thought I would, but when good conversation is flowing, you just keep it going. Uh, I just made that rhyme up at the at, uh, right now, I swear. Um, all right. All um, right. So we're done. We're out of time. Uh, We'll have a mailbag episode next week. Quick reminder, HOU mailbag at gmail.com. There it is at the bottom of the screen. HOU mailbag at gmail.com. Give us a subscribe. Give us a rating. Give us a review on the podcast as well as we get you ready for what should be a really fun season and training camp coming up of Texans football. So for my producer, Anthony Irwin, I am Sean Pendergast. We are out of time. We will see all of you on Tuesday of next week. Until then, have a great weekend, everybody. This has been the Utopia Football Podcast.